So hi, I'm John. Um, just uh, here to kind of introduce myself and um, talk about five things quickly. Uh, so four are glassware, and then I also have a hackathon um, that I wanted to kind of promote. Uh, so this is me. Um, I can this up too long, but hi, I'm John. Uh, I'm a Google developer expert for Glass. Um, is this not? Okay, is this better? All right. <laughs> so I'm a Google developer expert for Glass, um, and I work at a small company called Talkray, uh, Tickle, and Briar. Um, so uh, first thing is the hackathon for uh, Glass and education. Um, so I have two codes up there. Like, if anybody's interested, uh, this is going to be a 24-hour hackathon uh, from June 20th to 21st in San Francisco, the weekend before I/O. And that is like the address for the Eventbrite. And those are two discount codes. The free one, there's one of those available. So like the first person to get there is going to get a free ticket. And then there's five of the, of the discount codes. So like if you use that, if you're interested, uh, you'll get a, you know, a few bucks off. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, it's going to be you know, prizes. And uh, Alan and I are going to be there helping people out. Um, Jenny's going to stop by and be a judge. So very exciting. Um, so yeah, uh, that's for number one. Um, this is one that I've been working on for a few months. Uh, it's called Ceramic Notifier. And what it does is basically, um, I was walking around with glass on quite a bit. And I noticed that like uh, it was really nice to have, um, you know, whenever I got emails or text messages or whatever would show up in glass, like, you know, I knew that I didn't have to take out my phone and kind of interact. Uh, but there were also a lot of things that would buzz my phone that like didn't show up on glass. Um, so that was kind of the impetus for writing uh, ceramic notifier. Um, I think it's kind of interesting because it, it actually uses mirror API from an Android device. I don't have a server for this. Um, so uh, I'm going to open source this one pretty soon. Um, it was definitely a fun project to write. And it was like, you know, I've got about 60 people uh, using it right now. Um, it's still like alpha. And if you're interested in checking it out, like let me know. Um, I still have a little bit of room in my quota, <laughs> my API quota. Um, and then I did uh, this one, which is a glass gift camera. Um, I actually did it as a talk, so I, I live coded this in front of a room full, like maybe half the size. Um, and it was a GDK glassware um, as an immersion. So I'd go like, okay, glass, you know, grab a gift, and it would take a series of like five or ten uh, pictures and shrink them down and put them into a GIF. And this is actually the one that Glass created. Um, the flow is a little strange. Like uh, there were a couple things I probably could have uh, designed the, the UX flow a little bit better. Um, and I haven't gotten a chance to update it for XC16, but the source code is available for this one, and that is the URL for that. Uh, then I did this. So um, there's a uh, I think he's a medical resident um, at Kaiser, who is a glass explorer. And um, back in March or April, he, he got a hold of me and was kind of asking, like, you know, asking generally if you could do a hearing aid on glass because of the bone conduction speaker. And I was kind of thinking about it. I'm like, yeah, you know, you probably could. And then I just decided to write it because it turned out it only took about half an hour to write. Um, it's really simple. Uh, so you just you just say like okay glass um, listen to hearing aid and then it comes up and it's it's another immersion um, and, and all it does is it listens to you know whatever comes in on the microphone and then it replays it back to the bone conduction speaker. It's kind of interesting because there's a whole class of, of uh, hearing aids that use bone conduction. Um, so you know he was thinking that it might be like a little bit more socially acceptable like for uh, people who are hard of hearing like. They might, there might be less stigma involved with using glass as opposed to uh, an actual hearing aid. Um, he actually used this for clinical trials. Uh, turns out that it doesn't work as well as um, his regular hearing aids do. Like, uh, probably stuff that could be fixed, but the speaker's not quite loud enough. Um, and I'm doing this all in Java, so there's a bit of a delay. Um, we we'll probably cut it down using MDK, but uh, yeah, haven't gotten around to that yet. Um, of course, is also up for this one, so uh, 
that if you're interested in that. Um, I also have an EPK like, if you want to check it out. Um, yeah, this is the last one. Uh, so this is one I'm really excited about right now. Um, I've been working on this for a little while. Uh, so this is glassware that talks to like a Bluetooth heart rate monitor, like a chest strap. Um, and so it's actually working now. It, it does actually read a heart rate off of a chest strap and you know, present it. Um, and I have like a, a flow for connecting um, to uh, to a Bluetooth device. Um, it's not done yet, uh, and there's definitely a lot of features that I want to add. Um, but this one will be open source, and I will be looking for help on like kind of fleshing it out, and making it like something really great. So um, if you're interested in working on this one, uh, I've got a lot of ideas for, for what to do with it. And, um, yeah, feel free to vote me out. Okay, that's it. <laughs>
Use the model. Okay. Hi, everyone. Bear with me while I power things on and plug things in. How is everyone doing? Yay! Cool. So, the clicker work? Oh my gosh, it does. Cool. So, hi everyone. I'm going to be talking about the glass platform, how we got here. I'm going to tell you some stories about um, the journey that, that took us to uh, the place where we are with glass. Um, before I do that, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. Hi, I'm Jenny. I'm a developer advocate on Glass, um, which means that I help you do cool stuff for Glass, like writing Glassware. Um, and I work on the APIs, documentation, all that stuff is my fault, especially the cat jokes. And oh, if you want to reach me, I have a laser. Control both sides. Yeah, so there's uh, my Google Plus URLs up there, which is a great place to come, come ping me if I can help with anything. So a little more detail on what we're going to be talking about. Um, I'm going to set the stage a little bit by talking about the role prototyping has played on glass. It's been really important. And then I'm going to go through uh, design principles. And uh, those are kind of like the, the guidelines, the, the rules of thumb we use for a lot of our interface design and stuff like that. And the journey that got us there. Um, it's, it, was, uh, it was a long time. And then I'm going to talk about how the same stuff influenced our APIs as they developed. So let's start off by talking about prototyping. I'm going to move this thing. It will move as I go back and look at my notes. Anyway, uh, prototyping. So as a people, we are afraid of failure. Um, another way of looking at this is we're really good critical thinkers. We're good at shooting down ideas that seem risky. Um, and this is like there's probably a lot of good reason for this. Um, if you look back to a lot of our history as humans, a lot of the times we were anxious. Um, there was a lot online, like, you know, if we were hunting, something might come and eat us. And that would be a bad outcome. Um, but in the modern world, the risks we're exposed to are less serious. Um, we don't need to be as risk averse as we are. We can spend a lot more time doing and, and, and taking those risks. Um, at Google X especially, which is the group uh, from which we, we uh, glass came, um, we do a lot, we spend a lot of time fighting that instinct. We spend a lot of time making sure that we feel comfortable taking those risks and that we feel comfortable iterating and learning. To give you a uh, idea of why that's important, I'm going to tell you a little personal story about ceramics. Um, once, one, once upon a time, several years ago, I um, took some time and I learned how to do wheel pottery. So there's a big spinning wheel, and there's clay on it, and they made pots and vases and uh, bowls and other round things out of, out of dirt. Um, and one thing I noticed uh, that when I started the class is all the students kind of divided into two groups. Um, one group spent a lot of time really focused on learning the theory and the concepts behind what makes the perfect pot. How was the best way to center the clay on the middle of the wheel? What's the best way to start pulling up that cylinder? And they, they spent a lot of time thinking about it and talking about it and discussing it. And then another group of students in the class uh, it was a little bit more impatient, I guess you could say. They spent just enough time to learn how to get the clay to kind of stick on the wheel in the middle, and then they just started doing stuff. They started making pots and bolts. Um, and a uh, funny thing happened. Um, by the end of the class, which group do you think uh, had made uh, more progress, was making better bolts? Second group. Wow, I guess I'm reading my mind. And yeah, the answer is the second group Although you might not have suspected it during the first few days of class while clay flew across the room and hit the wall and stuff like that. Um, but by the end of the class, they were making much, they were much more productive. They were making, um, successfully making larger pieces that were, were, were better. Um, and the reason for that 
is while, while the first group was spending time thinking about theory and discussing, um, the second group was spending that same time building practical knowledge. They were, they were trying a lot of things, and they were doing the whole process from start to end and discovering all those quirks along the way. And they made so much more progress. And glass is no different. We, do, we did a lot of kind of rapid prototyping on glass. Would anyone here like to see an early example of a prototype? Cool, okay. So before I show you, how long do you think it took for us to build our first prototype of glass? And if, if you've seen this presentation before, you can't answer. 75,000 years. It's the longest anyone's ever guessed. Two months? Two months? Three months? A week? A year? One week. One week. One week. Uh, well, it actually took us about 30 minutes. And here it is. So this is, uh, this is the prototype. Um, as you can see, uh, it's made out of uh, some wire we found and some tape. Um, and what, the way it actually is displaying is there, we got a couple of sheets of plastic, which some of you may have used to cover book reports once upon a time. Um, we bought them at an office supply store. So we took those two pieces of plastic, and then we got a Pico projector, also from an office supply store. And then stuff around the office, and we threw it all together, and this is what we got. And believe it or not, it is a wearable computer, kind of like hooked on your shoulder, and you can see the display back here. Um, and it's displaying a web page right now. It's, it's a TechCrunch article. Um, and uh, it's crude, and it's kind of silly looking, but we learn a lot. So even though we only spent a few minutes creating it, over the next few days, we learned a lot about what it's like to design for transparent displays. As it turns out, it's kind of hard. Um, we learned a lot about interactions between people while someone was using a wearable computer, and just what it's like to wear a computer and like, try and live your life while you're while it's running. And it was a super useful experience. And uh, over time, obviously, the hardware got a little bit more refined, and uh, so did other stuff. Um, one of those areas was design. So from our early experiments, we kind of had a feeling there would be some principles that help guide, would help guide our design. Uh, and the reason for this is at the same time we were prototyping on hardware really rapidly, we were prototyping on user interface design. So we were trying a lot of stuff. We were throwing a lot of stuff to and seeing what stuck. And every time we had a new experiment, something new we wanted to try, there was kind of this like bold list that people prefixed their, 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 their demonstration with. It was kind of like the, the rules and the inspirations for that design. And over time, those bullets started to converge. And those points are kind of what became our design principles. And here they are. You probably hope maybe seen them before. Um, these are our five design principles. First one, design for glass. And what this means is take advantage of what makes this form factor unique when you build your software. Don't get in the way. Keep um, the barrier between your user's intent and the action they take as short as possible. Keep it relevant. It's important to deliver the right functionality at the right time. Avoid the unexpected. You're closer to your user than you ever have been before. Make sure you, uh, you keep that trust. And finally, build for people. Um, it's people who are wearing, wearing glass, and they're, they're, you're much closer to your user than you've ever been before. Again, um, and uh, make sure you use, keep that in mind when you're building software. So let's dig into these a little bit more, kind of give some explanation for how they came to be. We'll start with design for glass, because it was the first one at the top of the left list. Um, another way to think about this one is glass isn't for everything. You can't solve every problem that you can solve with another computing platform with glass or wearable computer. Uh, and also, transparent displays are hard. Because uh, glass is different. We spent a lot of time over the last few decades building software that is essentially for a rectangular screen on a rectangular box, which might have a keyboard. And um, glass, is, glass and wearables are one of the first, first times we're kind of diverging from it in a long time. Here's an example. It's a picture. It's a picture of an island. Um, it was actually taken with, with an early glass device. And it's a pretty picture. It's the kind of picture you might take with glass, or you might look at on glass. Um, yeah, it looks great. We noticed one thing, is depending on the situation, it looks really different. 
So it's a little bit blown out on these screens, but um, the same picture when viewed on glass on the inside um, with indoor lighting, it actually reproduces pretty well. You see the greens come out and the colors look pretty good. But in different lighting environments, uh, which is a little harder to see on this projector, uh, but which right on the previous slide, um, the color temperature is way off. The plants actually have shifted so far into the yellow that they look like they're dead. They look like they're brown. And the water is like almost purplish. And like it just the colors look completely different. And this was kind of a surprise to us. Um, color reproduction is really hard on transparent displays because the colors in the environment are going to influence, they're going to change the color that you're trying to display. So that is why you'll notice that most of the built-in widgets and most of our design guidance guide you towards monochromatic designs. Monochromatics in, in different levels of gray. Uh, they just work a lot better on transparent displays. Here's another example of glass not being for everything. Here's an interface. This is uh, actually a screenshot from a very early version of Glass. And um, yeah, kind of crazy, isn't it? A lot of stuff on there. Um, but if this was a, like a dashboard that you were writing for a different platform, it might make sense. I mean, we have a lot of the information you'll want at hand. You have your emails, tweets, um, other events, calendar, little gap chart type thing up there. Um, like it makes sense as a dashboard. We have information divided into hierarchies. It's kind of a way of interface where we're used to building interfaces. But on glass, this was completely and utterly overwhelming. And as we iterated, uh, we, we noticed things got simpler and simpler. And we displayed less and less information on the screen at a time until we arrived at something that was more like this. And you will notice in the glass interfaces and as well as the design guidance, we strongly recommend, and we enforce the software pretty often, only displaying one thing on the screen at a time. And this, uh, as much as we thought it, this is kind of almost a universal concept on our design guides. Even when there's a menu, you'll notice we display one item of the menu at a time, which essentially makes our interface like a giant button that you press. Um, and that just works a lot better. People get a lot less lost and a lot less overwhelmed. Um, and that's just something we just arrived at through a lot of usability testing. Next, don't get in the way. So we develop a great piece of software for another kind of computing. Um, say you're writing a video game or you're writing a productivity app. One way to know that you've been successful is your user gets totally sucked into your software. The rest of the world kind of fades away and they're like they're focused on your software, like almost meditating. They're so they're so engaged with it. Uh, that's great for a lot of platforms, but for wearable computing. Not really. That's actually a sign that you've kind of screwed something up. That's because in wearable computing, it's not the software that should take focus, it's the rest of the rest of the world around the user. The world should take precedence and the software should kind of blend into the background. This is why Glass is built a lot around micro interactions. You, you get in, you, you get the information you need, and you get on with your life. And you want to make sure that you don't do something silly and cause trouble. Like, we caught trouble on DevRel um, when we first got on the team. So back when we first joined, um, one of the first things we did is we played with the API to test it out. Um, so we built some stuff. And on our first day, we built an RSS reader. And we're like, this is great. We can get all the information we want, all the information we need, all our news sources and blogs, and we can get it all on glass right away. Super cool. So we got it tagged together in about a day using the Mirror API, which is pretty cool. It was a good proof that the API worked well, because you can look at the data implement it. And um, I immediately started loading in a bunch of feeds. I loaded in like Stack Overflow tags, and GitHub repos, and a whole bunch of news blogs, and all sorts of stuff like that. Loaded them all in there. I was like, cool, OK, this is fun. Getting updates while I'm doing work. Um, and then you know, the day was over, so I left. And I went, I went out. I actually went to a roller derby bath. So I was out watching roller derby hanging out, wearing glass. This was a couple years ago, so glass was fun to wear out at the time. People were super excited about it. Um, but what happened was I started getting a notification. Like, oh, okay, one. This is okay. A few more. 
um, until uh, started getting a little overwhelmed. They came um, fast and faster, and I kind of got swamped. As it turns out, a lot of people left work on the Pacific Coast in this time zone, went home, and then contributed to a bunch of open source projects and asked a bunch of questions of Stack Overflow. Uh, and I got overwhelmed, and it got so bad that I actually turned Glass off, which was a bummer because I wanted to use other features of Glass while I was there enjoying the game. And this is an example of software that got in the way. It kind of bummed me off. I had to turn it off. Don't do that. Um, but also, don't look past simple solutions to this to problems. As there's a better RSS reader. Someone wrote one, and it's available on my glass now. It's called Winkfeed. Um, and it is an RSS reader that behaves pretty similarly to the original one we wrote, except they've added a whole bunch of cool stuff to it to make it not get in the way. And some of the simple solutions they use are something simple like quiet hours. <laughs> Um, so I can go in and I can say, I only want my updates about all these feeds during the workday, because that's when I care about Stack Overflow Cluster. Um, they also, if you go through, there's also some, some things that kind of give you an idea of how many posts you're going to, how many notifications you're going to get from feeds you subscribe to, which is pretty cool. So although there are very interesting ways of solving this problem for certain situations, don't look past the easy ones. Next, keep it relevant. So relevance is different on wearable computing. For example, let's take the case of a shopping list. Here's a shopping list that I may have made on Keep. I use it on my phone, I use it on my tablets, on my desktop. It's a super cool way to keep track of stuff. I'll have lists, I'll kind of scroll through them, scroll around, and then I can know that when I'm shopping, I need a Nerf gun, healthy snacks, and a plush dinosaur toy. Important things. Um, and uh, my first impulse when building something for glass might just be to take that and just port it over to glass, that same experience. I would go in, I would ask, and I'd pull, what is my to-do list? Um, you want to try and avoid that where you can. Because on other kinds of computing, the, the distance between that intent and the action is already artificially long because I have to pull my phone out of the pocket. And I have to, like, there's, there's some step by the, just the fact of it being a phone but it takes me a few more steps to like get to start to get to my data in best case. But with glass, it's kind of always on on my, my head. So it's always right there. So you can take advantage of the fact that you can minimize the number of steps between that intent and that action. And for a shopping list, something like displaying that information. Um, if you know that I just entered a supermarket, display my grocery list. Now, this is just an example. Um, but Definitely take advantage of all of the sensors and other information you have about me to make sure that you, you deliver that relevant content at the right time. Um, it should be kind of a magical experience. You should, should be doing less pulling and more just getting at the right time. Next, avoid the unexpected. This one I don't have like a personal tale about um, because we kind of knew this one from the beginning. Um, and in general, it's kind of a really big Google rule is uh, you know, the user comes first. So you don't want to surprise the user with something. Um, for example, cabbage. I like cabbage as much as the next person. And 25 cents off, that's a lot. But I might not want to be getting that information at 3.34 in the morning. Well, the other question is, why am I wearing glass then? But that's another question. <laughs> but this is just kind of a silly slide to illustrate the point. Um, you don't want to, you want to make sure that your user has an expectation of the content you're going to be delivering and the behavior you're going to deliver at that time. So a great example of this working is on, um, which slide? Okay. Uh, is like on Sports Yapper and some of the other sports uh, glassware. Sports updates, especially if I'm following a team that's playing in a different part of the world, I, I might expect to be getting updates at 3 in the morning because they might be playing then. And this is a situation where it doesn't, they don't necessarily explicitly tell me every like, detailed information about the updates I'm going to get, but by the fact that I'm favoring certain teams or leagues, I have an expectation of, as a user of knowing how much stuff I'm going to get and when I'm going to get it. Um, and then some other cases, you just have to make it explicit. But the important thing is that your, your users know what they're getting themselves into. Next, build for people. This one is much more abstract, but it's possibly the most important one, which may be why we put it at the end. Uh, 
And um, with glass, we're actually wearing the computer. Like, you can actually infer a lot about my anatomy as a person by looking at glass, much more so than you would be able to determine, like, my anatomy as a human by looking at a laptop. Because if you looked at a laptop, not knowing anything about humans, you might assume that we have, like, 104 fingers and one giant eye. Um, but with glass, like, you get a much better idea of kind of, like, the shape of our head and, like, there's something that sees light through there and all that kind of stuff. This has an impact on how we build software. You have to take into account the anatomy of the person using the device. For example, early on in glass, we spent a lot of time experimenting with head gestures as an interface control. So we use head gestures a lot with the accelerometer um, to try and determine how to work, walk through menus and stuff. And if you'll notice, when using glass, the amount of head gestures we use has diminished greatly. There's only like a couple left in the whole interface. Um, like the web browser, which is kind of clutched and moving through one of the main menus. And the reason for that is um, once we left our desks, we noticed something. Because while we were at our desks and we were coding, they worked pretty well. You can actually move through the menus, it was great. And then we started wearing them out. We started going outside and we started like entering the real world while using it. And we noticed like whenever we turned a corner, it would start moving through menus. Um, and sometimes when we were just moving around, like you could use for a little jog or something, it would start triggering events. Um, and that's bad. Um, another thing we noticed is that the while we were sitting at our desk, head movement was actually a pretty good predictor of where we were looking. But when we were out in the world, the position of our eyes was actually a much bigger part of the perception of our gaze um, than the position of our head. So it was more about the movement of our eyes. And just that our heads were kind of like human heads are just not the most um, stable things. And then, so as a result, we just had to get rid of a lot of those gestures. But say you were designing a wearable computer for a different kind of being. It's not a, not a person. For example, a bird. Like most birds, maybe all birds, their eyes are basically fixed in their head. So their gaze is a very good indicator of what they're looking at. And they also have incredibly stable necks. <laughs> Look at that. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> okay, that's, it's really silly. Um, but I really wanted to excuse it to put that video into do a presentation, and I finally found it. But say you were designing a wearable computer for a bird, you might be able to use head gestures a little bit more. Okay, we've talked a lot about kind of the, the designs that got us there and a lot of kind of abstract stuff about those design patterns. Let's talk a little bit more about, uh, let's, do, let's get a little bit more concrete on our design principles. So I'm going to give you some more concrete examples of those five principles and how they kind of play out in actual software. The first one is don't build an app. We spend a lot of time building apps where the model is I go, I launch my app, and then my app contains a set of behaviors, and I pick a behavior and I do that. So it'd be like, I launch the game, I go to settings, or I go to play game. Um, that doesn't work as well in wearable computers. And that goes back to that point about minimizing the time between the user's intent and the user's action. You have an opportunity um, with wearables to, to kind of keep that super short. Take advantage of that. Rather than thinking about your, your software as an app, which is like a container for all the stuff you want to provide, Think about it instead as a collection of actions that the user wants to take, play the game, configure the game, and a set of data, like the notifications that come in. This is why um, instead of having kind of a generic app launcher, we have a voice command menu. That's why we don't call a launcher, because there's no reason that your, your glassware can't have multiple points of entry. So take advantage of that. Next. White is the new black. In general, you'll notice almost everything is, is white colors on a dark background when building for glass. And this is something we discovered with transparent displays. Probably works on other transparent displays, too. pretty much the same. Is um, if you have just a white or gray interface that you just pour to the glass, it kind of hurts your eyes when you first turn it on. Um, and uh, that's because black stuff ends up being much more transparent on a, on, on a display like glasses. So uh, a good place to start if nothing else, is almost to invert a UI you might already have, or just in general keep it black background with, with white text. Next, establishing hierarchy with color. 
So glasses display, um, you can actually read about seven lines of text comfortably on it. This is kind of the, the smallest text we recommend. Most of the time you want bigger, this only has four lines of text. Um, and as a result, you don't have as much leeway with size as you might be used to on other interfaces. So when you're establishing hierarchies of information, use different gradations of color. Um, this is uh, builds all of our default fonts for that way. So if you use the mirror API and you throw a bunch like H1, H2, H3 tags into the HTML, you'll see a breakdown like this. Next, make it glanceable. There are two interfaces up here. One is a pretty picture, and one is just, uh, just, just a, most of a circle. Who likes the interface on the right more? Oh, a few people. Uh, 10%. Who likes the interface on the left more? 30%. And 60% slackers. <laughs> but yeah, so I actually like the, the one with the picture more, which is, uh, I'm always bad at doing the right left. It's, it's your, your, your left. Yeah, your left. I like the one on the left more. But science indicates otherwise. Um, when we take these and we put them on someone's head and we actually measure how long it takes them to process the information, you can actually figure out how long that glance ends up being. And um, when you have a lot more information on the screen, it takes people longer to process it. A lot longer in this case. Which means that if we want to keep people in the world, keep people in, the rea in their reality, and we want our software to blend into the background, Simpler interfaces with a much smaller number of information chunks, much less, like, many fewer edges to process. They work a lot better because people can process them much faster. And this is something that your user may not be able to um, consciously tell you if you do usability testing. But wow, this will kind of kind of build up quickly. Because uh, enough of those 0.9 second intervals and some of these things using Glassware can kind of add up. So definitely be aware. Simpler interfaces um, with fewer information chunks will be better even if they're less pretty. <laughs> Next, design for emotion. So as humans, we kind of have some hard wiring, um, some hardware acceleration on kind of emotionally sensitive topics. This is another area where you can make it blend into the background even more. Rather than just displaying a big number for a heart rate monitor, I'm always thinking about your heart rate monitor, John. That's great. But using things that kind of elicit an emotional response. In this case, a big green thumbs up that says you're right at your target heart rate. That's going to be much easier for people to process quickly um, because you're using you're taking advantage of some of that other stuff in them. <coughs> and finally, include others in the fun. So we're at a stage with glass and, and wearable computing in general where there's a lot of situations where only one person in a group will have will have that piece of hardware. Which means when you're building your software, take into account the other people around you. So the, here's an example of a game. We implemented like a taboo-like word game. And we only needed one device to play with the whole group. And it was, you can see, we're having tons of fun in this picture. It's because it is fun. So when you're building software, make sure you take into account the people around whoever has the device on. And just to recap, those are our design principles. And so presented you, uh, hopefully it was a useful peer into kind of the journey that led us to these principles. And um, what I recommend for using them is don't treat them like hard and fast rules, but treat them more like that instruction manual that came with that really cool tool. You may want to strap rocket in instead to like kind of fly it around, which is not what the designer intended. Um, and that, that's cool too, but it's usually a good idea to at least understand the manual before you completely disregard it. So that's what I'd recommend for these design principles. We know there's a lot of other possibilities of cool designs that are going to work well, but these are the ones we know work today, so they're a good place to start. And meanwhile, in the land of code, so while we were iterating on the hardware, and while we were also iterating on the design, we were at the same time iterating on the APIs. They all kind of co-developed at the same time. And uh, what this ended up yielding was a platform with two big pieces. We have the Glass Development Kit, which we kind of knew from day one. Uh, Glass Development Kit is basically writing Android software, essentially, um, with a different set of interaction components, different set of widgets that you, use, you run on Glass. And then we also have a second big piece called the Google Mirror API. 
Um, the Merit API is more is a, a RESTful web service based one that uses web standards and you, have, you can use it to pass messages around. It's asynchronous and it uses a lot of web technologies in it. So to dig into them a little further, GDK, since it's you're actually running code on the Glass device itself, uh, allows you to do stuff when you were not connected to the internet. Allows execution of off, uh, execution while you're offline. It uh, since you're running code on Glass, it can do stuff in real time and it can make use of the hardware that's there, like the sensors and stuff like that. The Mirror API, on the other hand, provides a lot of built-in functionality out of the box. So you can get stuff with a much smaller piece of much smaller um, amount of code you write. You can you can produce functionality, a simple functionality pretty easily. It's also using RESTful web services, which are inherently language and platform independent. So in Android, you're going to be writing mostly in Java. In for the Mirror API, you can write in any language you want, and you're also taking advantage of a whole bunch of common infrastructure. All the synchronization and a lot of things that are kind of hard get, are kind of done for you already. Now those are the two different components of our platform, but um, they're very different. How on earth did we end up with this? Well, I'll tell you. So we knew from day one that we'd have like a glass development kit. There would be a GDK. There would be a way for you to run essentially Android software on glass. Um, Kind of an obvious thing based on our platform selection. And the technology, like all the tech, tech stuff, pretty much worked. A lot of the, the, the fundamental APIs, like background services, and especially the, 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 the concept of using activities um, as, as potentially multiple entry points on software actually worked really well on Glass. But some of the design stuff, particularly like UI widgets, the default Android ones didn't quite work. They were, some of them worked, but they were really clunky. And in general, they didn't work at all. So we, we had the drawing board and we started building out the components that allowed you to easily make stuff that looked good on glass. And um, one way we tested it is we started building software, which is what we did. We built some of the built-in software for glass, like Google Plus, SMS, Google Now. So we're building that and while we were building those components, we were, we were figuring out what was gonna be going into the GDK platform. And then we noticed that um, a lot of them kind of had shared code. Actually, a whole bunch of them were starting to use, they, they code got so similar between them that they were actually using the same libraries um, across them. And what these were doing is all of these apps were simple message passing. They, they were not super time sensitive. They were doing message passing with stuff, data from the internet. Um, and like examples were like Google Now notifications about weather or SMS and email um, or like social networking and photo sharing on Google Plus. Uh, and all these, there was so much in common behind these that we decided to roll that into another API. So it would be easy for you to build stuff that use this kind of like synchronization use case. And that's kind of how the uh, Mirror API became a thing, is uh, we noticed there was a whole class of software. And uh, just by chance, well, probably by chance, but it came out first. And the reason it came out first is it required less work for us to build all the APIs to support, or build all the software to support that API. And it actually worked out pretty well because uh, the Mirror API has one big benefit is that it's actually harder to build bad glassware with the Mirror API. It's, it's more constrained. So if you just kind of do default stuff, you end up with software that works pretty well. GDK, on the other hand, it's much easier to shoot yourself in the foot. So another way of looking at this is that uh, the Mirror API is intended to make a certain set of easy things easy. And uh, a GDK, on the other hand, is intended to make other broader hard stuff possible, the really cool things. So, in conclusion, if you get two things out of this talk, other than the chicken slide, that's important too. Um, the prototyping theme. So, while we were building glass, the APIs, the design, the hardware, we spent a lot of time iterating really fast. And we don't think uh, that we should be the only ones doing that. I really encourage you that when you build software for glass or other wearables or other kinds of ubiquitous computing, get your first viable prototypes out as fast as you can. Just hack them together, barely working, um, and then start using them in your life. Use them when you're out at the supermarket. Use them when you're out playing, when you're doing sports, when you're living your life. And you'll find that you can learn a whole lot 
from a minimal investment that will result in you building much better software in the end. So I encourage you to keep prototyping. It's worth it. That's it. So, questions and answers. I think you have a microphone here. <gasps> cool, okay. So, actually, maybe I'll just repeat questions. That might be easier to pass the mic on. I'll just repeat questions. Right. You're closest to me, so I saw you first. So, uh, so maybe really good talk. Uh, you can talk more about the environment, like the uh, test piece for the community game. Uh, I've done a lot of Android development. And I'm curious, like, if you don't have all the UI games, what kind of resistance do you have? Do you have a system like set up these things or you can try? So the question was about UI widgets on Android, and I will show you. I will bring up the docs because that's what I do. So no. Why did I ask me to authenticate? Anyway, um, so. If you go to our handy dandy documentation, uh, you will find uh, there's well I'll just go straight to the reference facts since you already since you mentioned you're a text, you're an Android developer. So if you go over to the GDK reference, you can actually see um, we have a little widget section and we have a view section and there's a card view. Cool. So if you just hit the reference docs, um, if you move around, you'll find that we have a small set of these components that are useful in building our stock. So, um, and there's also this pattern section, or GDK guides. Here we go, GDK guides, um, which will help guide you through using these components to build stock. Um, but the first step I would do is use glass, and you will notice that there are certain kind of UI paradigms. We have these like cards that live to one side of the clock. Um, we have these like immersions that pop up and go away. And they, um, a lot of them are just like straight lifted out of Android. An Android activity becomes a glass immersion. Is kind of the UI name for that um, software component. And then we have some other ones that kind of fill the gaps where they don't exist. Like those cards that kind of sit as part of the main timeline are what's called live cards, um, which are implemented simply, you can implement them either by directly drawing to them or using something like uh, remote views, which you may have used for lock screen widgets. Uh, and that's another component. So if you go through the docs, you can see um, we have information about how these components exist and how they fit together. Um, we also have design guidance which you might find useful also. So there's like a whole UI overview which links out to all the different um, uh, GDK docs. Second question was about an emulator. There is no emulator for glass. It is on our to-do list but we haven't gotten to it yet. Um, and the reason there's no emulator for glass is we found that emulating it at our desktop and that was one of the pitfalls we discovered, was developing only on our desktop resulted in bad software. So um, we think it's really important that you build software on hardware and you use it in your life, which is why there's not, which is why the emulator is not as high priority as other platform features. So there will be an emulator someday, because we understand it's really important for testing a lot of other stuff. But for now, um, we've been, we're very much focused on getting the API feature stable and bigger. So there's no emulator yet. So yes, to develop for Glass, or you need to have a glass hardware. So the question is, why is glass on the right side? The glass is on the right side because there is a touchpad here, and more people are right-handed, and because we. We had to pick one. I'm not, not, nothing gets up there, but we had to pick one to get started uh, because making two is twice as many things to, you know, robots and molds and all that kind of so stuff. So it's, it's, we've got a, a lot of oh, yes. books up here from O'Reilly. Uh, if you ask a question that Jenny's able to answer, <laughs> then you get a book. If you yeah. ask a question talking about, like, tell me when the next release, whatever it is, is going to be, I can't answer. You get a good book. So ask good questions. Don't ask about patents. Don't ask about future. None of those. And uh, come up and see Peter. If you've already asked a question that uh, can you answer, feel free to come up and get a book from Peter. Cool. Okay. I'll go over to this side of the room. Okay. 
מספיק קורא So the first question, I don't really understand, but, you might wanna, um, but I can answer the second question right away. The second question was, how do you, so we've done all this prototyping, how do you, do verif how do you verify the prototypes? And um, for kind of the early stage of verification, we just went out and we used it, and we like used glass in our lives, and we learned a lot from that. And later stage of the verification, a lot of you are very familiar with, because we did, we did uh, the Explorer program. Um, we sold dev kits for glass early on to a small set of people, um, and people were in this room. Um, who are helping us continue to, to learn how the learn how glass works in their lives and how to iterate and make it better? Do I agree because like, every product means that the glass or the glass has a process for the environment. Yes, we did stuff a little differently than, than we've done before. You're welcome. Okay. Next question. Ah, so the question is, what's the best way to get students involved with Google Glass development? Hmm. I don't really have a stock answer to this question. Um, I would say get them glass and get them building on it, um, especially if they have any projects that involve building stuff for glass, because um, that's kind of the first. Hmm. Okay, I need someone further back. Sorry? Murphy's Law? My Law? Question is, how do you turn off Google Glass? Um, it spends most of its time kind of in standby mode, um, but if you want to turn it off, there's a button right there. You hold it down, just like an Android phone, it'll turn off. Yeah, so it, it turns off. All right, I'm going to go get someone from the back because I haven't talked to anyone in the back yet. So, way back in the back. Is there a priority list for apps? Sorry? Ah, so is there a priority list of apps we want for Glass? Great question. Um, so I would say that I'm not the best person to answer that question. You probably are. Because what I found makes the best Glassware is when people have a passion for something. I don't know what it is. Cycling, horse breeding, I don't know. Whatever you're really into. Um, and finding a problem that is solved by Glass better than other things. Um, and uh, that seems to be where the best, best stuff comes from. It comes from the stuff that you know better than most of the people around you. Um, those kind of those niche problems that really kind of you can knock them out of the park. Oh, so many questions. Okay, I'm gonna pick at random. How are you? Yeah. So, is there a way to communicate with mobile and glass? So, is there a way to communicate between a mobile device and glass? So, um, by default, what glass does is there, there's a companion app on your iPhone or your Android phone. That we use to share internet connectivity and so a few other things, GPS data. Um, so that means you have, you're very likely to have an existing Bluetooth bond. You can use that to communicate between them, but in general, I have found when talking about specific problems with people is that if you are, are you communicating with the phone, there's probably a better way to do stuff. Um, in general, like some people have by, by instinct try to offload computation onto the phone, um, but what we find is that. You might be moving to something with two or three times the power. Um, in those situations, it's almost always better to take the additional latency and offload it to the internet. And then you get you know, servers connected to mains electricity to do your processing. 
Um, so you get you know a hundred fold gain instead of a, a three or four or five fold gain. Uh, but yes, if there are situations where like because of the way you want to interact, you want to use a phone in conjunction with glass, uh, Bluetooth three ARCOM seem to be the easiest way to go. Seems to work best. I worked with the file transfer. With file transfer, you could transfer files over it. I don't. I don't. I um, mean, an ARCOM is a serial port essentially, so you can send data over the serial port. Um, I haven't tried to do anything else. Sorry? Use the glass as a server. Um, so in this case, let's see. I'm trying to remember all the Bluetooth terminology. Um, but yes. Hmm? Android has a built in web server? I have never used that to try and solve this problem. I would find, uh, so yeah, if you had Bluetooth and you, made an, you, you created an IP stack on top of that, you could use third. Underneath, though, Bluetooth, Bluetooth is a great way to communicate between them. Bluetooth 3. Bluetooth 4, um, the profile isn't set up like this. So, so now you're off glass. So the question was, there's a lot of stuff available. I have my phone, I have my Android Wear device, I have Glass. What do I use for what problems? And I think that's, that is a, a, a something we're very much um, figuring out. Um, that is something that's still a, a, a set of problems we're solving now. Um, certain things are going to work better for certain people in certain situations. So I encourage you to experiment. I don't have any best practices to disclose right now. I mean, they're just, they have, they're yet to be written. So consider the opportunity to dig in and help us figure that out. So the question is, does Google have a vision? We don't have anything we've talked about publicly at this time. Um, Where and Glass are, um, so what I have to say about that is they are a little different right now. Um, if you played with the emulator, you could observe that. Um, but we're, 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 they're not going to fragment. We're going to bring them together. There's going to be a, a sensical story between all of them. Um, that that much, I, I can promise. <laughs> Yay! Okay. So who's had their hand up the longest? Okay. So I'm way at the back. I'm not really sure. You seem to raise your hand higher than anyone else. All right. So the question is, um, so with this being so new and there being so few opportunities to really be ex an expert, or being so new in the area, what are the top the question is, what are, what, what are we looking for in UX uh, for recruiting? That is something outside of my area of expertise. I do not know much about how the UX team recruits, um, but just picking a wild guess out of the air, um, building cool glass for my dear star. Uh, but I'm kind of biased because my mission is to make more glass for happen. So actually, I don't have an answer to that. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, so, um, so, can you talk a little bit about because there was a big like debate, like not a debate, like people were mad basically when Google announced its policy on one of like they seen like ads and also like what you can can do. Like, what's the latest right now and how? Where where do people download all these glass apps from? Is there glass play store or what do you have? So the question there are two questions. One is where do I get glassware? Yeah, so apps are glass, we call them glassware. Um, so like I actually, I don't know if I'm gonna bring it up right now. I don't know what glassware I have installed because I've been hacking on. But if you go to google.com slash my glass, there is that is that is the, the glassware place where you can go get glass glassware. Um, the uh, the other question was about developer terms and that kind of stuff, which you can find on the docs too. If you go over into do 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 going to develop. Um, we have these these policies and terms, developer policies and um, terms of service on our APIs. And there are certain things that um, we, we don't allow on Glass right now. Advertising. Um, we also don't allow you to charge your Glasser at this time. Um, there's also other things in there like don't use Glass to build weapons. Um, like Glass should not kill someone by functioning or malfunctioning. So like no life critical things. Like there's just a bunch of stuff in there. If you've read any API terms. Um, there's nothing too too surprising here. It's it's written by Larry Katz. Um, but there were some ones in there that, that um, 
were very important to people who write mobile apps, which is like monetization. And right now, there's there's um, you can't sell um, a, soft, a glass app. But the truth is, the user base is not huge right now, so you're not going to make a lot of money yet anyway. We will have a monetization story. We haven't announced it yet. We will have. We know you need a way to make money. Um, and by once there once there's enough users like for that to make sense, we will have a story um, for you how to make money um, with Glass. Uh, and what that kind of reveals is that our developer terms are this way right now because we're at a special place in the Explorer program. But they they, they can change, um, and they they may they they will change. Um, so as Glass becomes a more uh, refined product, we understand it better. We understand how people are using it to write software, and we understand the kinds of monetization that makes sense for Glass. The developer terms will get amended and change. So, um, if you want to learn about how, so I think the question was about how, where do you get our design guidance on glass? Or where, where do we post our design? How do I know that I should take the risk of buying glass in the part if I don't know that uh, that's going to satisfy my specific So, for design guidance, which is, which is where a lot of this detail is, if you go over into the design guidance, you can see a lot of information there um, about like the way we recommend the UI to be laid out. But one of the cool things about Glass is um, it's a pretty hackable device. So if you are doing something that falls outside of what we expect, you always have the opportunity to go to lower and lower level. For example, we have rooted bootloaders. So um, we have a set of APIs, and even within that, you can write any any address you want, and it's probably going to work. Like there's some stuff that's not on there, um, and some stuff that doesn't work. But um, in general, just throwing random Android code in, you could put 100 lines of text on the screen if you want. It's going to be very hard to read. Um, but if you want to go even further than that, we have rooted bootloaders. So you can go and you can remove all the system software. So if you want to make Glass dedicated to a, if you, if you want to, just want to use it as hardware and you want to get rid of our software, you're welcome to. And there's also a YouTube video from a Google I.O. session last year where we show you how to um, install Ubuntu on it. So if you want to remove Android, you can also go to yet a lower level, which I haven't seen anyone do yet, and switch over to Ubuntu. Um, so uh, we want to make sure that it can satisfy your needs. But the original question was back to microinteractions. The hardware really is designed for microinteractions. Uh, that's why the display is up and to the right. That's why the display is not in front of the app. Um, and uh, yeah, that's. So the hardware is really designed for microinteractions, so we're, all of our design guidance moves towards that. Um, but you're, you're welcome to hack the hardware and use it to solve other problems or problems in different ways if you like. But the question was, Android emulator, why doesn't it work? So uh, the Android emulator, you can the reason you can't use it is because the Android emulator doesn't know how to do a lot of the controls Glass has. And a lot of the Glass-specific code is um, the emulator doesn't know about. So when you try to run a Visa Blaster on the emulator, it'll say, class def not found, I couldn't find the live card, blah, I'm dead. Um, that's why the emulator doesn't work. It just has not, when, when, when you build, uh, when you enhance the emulator to handle new hardware, you add stuff so it can hook into those things. And those aren't there. OK, so way in the back. So um, you said it was really designed for microinteractions. My question is, is that a policy or a part of an effort to extend the glass to do things like virtual reality, um, you know, uh, extend hardware. I know we've talked a lot about software, but like extending the hardware functionality to the glass for other sort of uh, applications. What do you mean by extend the hardware? Like doing virtual reality or like GoPro go -go like functionality. Like could you? So how would you extend the hardware to accomplish some of those things? Maybe, maybe turn it to a helmet. You know, there was a thing that Facebook got. Turn into a helmet with the yeah. Oculus Rift. Yeah. Bye. I understand your question now. I'm going to go back to the front so I stop making feedback. Um, so the question was, glass is designed for micro-interactions. Um, is this just a software thing? Is it a hardware thing? Can I hack it? 
Um, the answer is, it's both a software and a hardware thing. Um, the software and the hardware are both developed alongside each other. And um, the reality is, is that um, we thought it was very important that the user of glass should be able to make eye contact with people around. That is why the display is not in front of your eye. Because eye contact is such an important reason. We wanted the glass display, whether it was on or whether it was off, to not interfere with a lot of those really important social cues. Um, that, that went a lot of the way towards how we designed glass. Glass is also designed to be very you know, light on your nose, which is why it's a smaller display. It doesn't cover your whole field of vision. Um, so those are kind of design constraints that were built into it, and the software developed alongside that. So you'll find that the software is kind of geared towards those kinds of micro interactions. That doesn't mean that you can't like configure the nose pads to push glass down in the middle of your field of view. Um, you can do that. Uh, there are people doing it. I think uh, I've seen a demo where someone had six glass devices that were stacked up in front of uh, the face that were networked with each other, and they were using it to kind of display one big old canvas. Um, the truth is, if you're getting that far, there's probably other hardware that's better for that. Um, like the Oculus Rift. It's great at doing those kinds of whole world overlays. Um, that's what it's designed for. Glass is designed for something else. So when you engage in a project, take into account what it's designed for and how much you're willing to push it out of that envelope. And just try and find the best thing for that application. Because um, glass, like as a trade-off for all those things, glass is super light. It has like 11 grams of force down in your nose or something. It makes it really comfortable. Okay. Who else has been waiting the longest? Bye. Can you do point by point eye tracking with the sensors on glass? The answer to that is no. Glass cannot does not have a camera pointed at your eyes. There are a lot of open source hardware projects out there that show you how to build them for as little as ten dollars, which is pretty cool. Um, but uh, glass does not have an eye tracker. If you actually look at glass, there's a little tiny window in there. And there's a little hole in the window, and the hole is actually the microphone. But below the hole, if you were to point an infrared camera at it, like a cell phone camera, you would see a little red glow. And the, the question was, uh, can you tell if you blink or wink? Um, so the little tiny infrared sensor just below the microphone can is basically essentially a one pixel infrared camera. So not, not a, it's a sensor. It's, a, it's an infrared proximity sensor. And with that and the magic of algorithms, um, glass does know when it is on your head and when it is off. It also knows when you're winking. I mean, it's actually built, one of the built-in features that you can configure to take a photo when you wink. I don't have it on. Um, yeah, so you, you can gather some information from that. Yeah, the glassable notifications. So another thing it can do is it will know when you're looking at the screen. So if you've just gotten an audio notification that something has happened, if you look at the screen, it'll bring the screen on, which is really cool. Yeah. Uh, you that is the infrared proximity sensor. Is there an API that so the question, is there a programmatic interface to the proximity sensor? No, that's not exposed to the current sensor stack. So the, the uh, proximity sensor, is there a driver and Android that talks to it? Yes. So is there, is there a driver and Android that talks to it? I don't know the details of how, how far that goes down. Um, I, I know people have, uh, there are some open source solutions that have reverse engineered that sensor, um, but they are not a stable part of the API service. So I encourage you to hack on it, but <laughs> me. The question is, who do, you, who do I talk to about API stuff? The answer is me. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> How would one get a hold of that API? How would one get a hold of that API? So um, we have uh, an issue tracker where, where we keep track of all the issue requests. Yes, please, please. I think it might already be in there. So if you see it in there already, you can only star something, and then you'll get notified when we update it. Um, yeah, there's no, that's not exposed to the API right now. This is, uh, you can say the, the interfacing infrared sensor, however Wink works. I want to be able to access it because it's Wink work. And I'm pretty sure that's in there. That, that was a request from, I think that was requested quite a while ago. Go to that. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> we request, we always three out requests to come. <laughs> huh? 
more people start something, we do pay attention to the issue tracker. So if there's something you want, please start the issue. We use that as a signal when determining our prioritization on features. Please send that question to you. Please, please don't bring, or please don't gain the issue tracker though. Like, we'll only use it seriously. It makes it actually an important source of data for us. So the question was um, modularity on glass. What are our plans for more modularity? So right now, glass, you can unscrew the little screw and you can take off the frame and you can put on prescription lenses uh, or the regular band. Um, that is, a, that, is the, the, that is the modularity of it right now, uh, but in terms of future stuff, I cannot talk about things that are in the future because they have not happened. I cannot, uh, I think my official press sheet answer is I cannot comment on rumors or speculation, um, which is my generic answer for it. It's the future, it hasn't happened yet. I don't know. So, I don't know. I, I heard some of your hands going back and forth. <laughs> Can you tell the difference between and can you tell the difference between winking and blinking? So the glass device uh, can can determine when you winked. Um, it does not do anything when you blink. So if you have a wink to take a photo on, it will not false positive when you blink. Um, or if it does, you should probably recalibrate it. So it can it can uh, it can identify a wink. I think that that's uh, all I can infer from the, the state of the features on glass. Question number five. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what's the thing Can you, can you, because uh, I feel this would be a better, like, a device to yourself. I would see the, you know, the same control that you had working on the lens, that, uh, like, the, 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 like, the, the fire lens, like, the contact lens? The contact lens? Yeah, the contact lens. What about making the glass, like, a contact lens? So, so the question was, uh, Google had a press release about a contact lens um, uh, that uh, is a, uh, a contact lens computer, essentially. Um, will glass be a contact lens computer? I don't know. Um, so the, the, the contact lens uh, is a sensor for determining, uh, inferring blood glucose levels. Um, glass is a more complicated device. Um, but beyond that, I can't comment on rumors or speculation. <laughs> I have a list of the apps that have already been done. <laughs> Identifying the car that just hit you. That is not a piece of glassware that exists today. Um, but yes, yeah, so it's on google.com slash myglass. If you go there, you can see all of the glassware that, that are public. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, in the back, middle back. Uh, derivation on another question. Huh? What's a piece of glassware that you would like to see? <laughs> what is a piece of glassware that I would like to see? And you see that's, that's, that's kind of a, a, a not the most fair question because if I want a piece of glassware, I will write it. Um, okay, because you don't have that's what I do. Um, huh, let me think about that. What would be a cool piece of glassware? One that hasn't really been tackled yet is actually that one in one of my slides, which is I want to see my grocery list when I walk into the supermarket. Into a location is really hard. Um, so I think some other problems might need to be, need to be solved to do that. Um, one silly one. There used to be this little box you could get and you could put in your you could put in your car and it would like you could like drive it and it would tell you like G forces and horsepower and that stuff. That would be kind of fun. Um, just do a little um, a horsepower one that you drive and then you take it off and like, oh. Yeah, I got so much first power. I don't know. Well, we can talk about that afterwards. Let's, let's we can brainstorm together. Why isn't design for battery one of the design principles? One of the questions: Why isn't design for battery one of the design principles? So the design principles are mostly focused on kind of functional user interface stuff. Um, but yes, be power conscious. That is an important thing too. Uh, although I don't know if my UX team would care as much, but they should. Um, so yes. Yeah, so glass has a smaller battery than a cell phone has. So it's something to take into account when designing your software. When you, if you're pulling on sensors, you might want to pull a little slower than you're used to. Um, you might want to be smarter about when you, you, you know, how you use resources in general. So be very power conscious when you're building software for the class. Okay, 
talked about a lot of lessons learned in the uh, software UX. Uh, can you talk about the hardware lessons that you guys learned or prototyping and how many iterations you start actually? There are hardware lessons and prototyping. So um, how, so I talked a lot about the UX. Um, can I talk more about the hardware? Because I did kind of jump from the first prototype to the contemporary one, didn't I? Um, we have there are pictures out there. I think we have some slides of five or six different prototypes. And we also did a um, roadshow. Uh, when we go to the city and we did those big demo events, we actually have a museum of different glass devices. Um, but I do not, some, of, some things with glass have, have never been shown in public. Um, so I can't talk about those. And I actually don't remember exactly the prototypes we've displayed so far. Um, but uh, in general, what you will notice if you look at the prototypes lined up is that the display moved up into the left out of the way of the pupil. Um, that was kind of the biggest thing that's changed in the hardware, other than the fact that it's gotten lighter. Um, another thing we designed for a lot was keeping the downward pressure on the nose lighter, um, because as it turns out, the majority of what people perceive as weight on glasses is the downward force on their nose, um, which is one reason the battery is back here. It's a counterbalance. Um, those are kind of the two things that come to mind uh, about the hardware, um, like like glass so, um, with the non-prescription version. I think has like I forgot the exact number. It's like 11 grams of force on down on your nose, which is lighter than a lot of eyeglasses. Um, yeah, it's well, <laughs> is it open source and is there NDK? So. Glass, the entire glass stack is not open source. Parts of it are. Um, the kernel um, is uh, uh, the, the Linux kernel that's powered on Android uh, GPL. So then if you go to the dev docs, you can actually find the uh, the kernel source code. I don't know if anyone's, I don't know, I think I know one person who built it. But if you go to the developer docs, which uh, my laptop is asleep now, so I don't know if it's going to come back. But just below that system image page, I had a System and kernel. So if you scroll down on the same page, it's not showing up. Oh, I hit the button there. I don't know what happened there. Okay, I can try after. They're, they're, they're on the, if you go search for system and kernel, there's their source code for the kernel there. I only know a couple of people who bothered to build it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's uh, yeah, the, well, most of the other stuff isn't open source. Like some of our client library stuff is, but not all of it. NDK, does NK, NDK work on Glass? Yes. So it uh, has an OMAP 4430 processor, which is ARM 7M. So if you build NDK and you target ARM, it works. I know people have built some NDK stuff. Um, like WordLens, one of our glassware that does real-time translation uses NDK. Because otherwise, it would be really hard to process a video stream in real time without a job lab. Okay. So I have a hardware question. Um, hardware. I've seen something. You guys recently announced the uh, Dynamo Person Bird thing. I know you've done some other lenses and stuff. Are there any accessories that you have thought about personally that you want to accomplish something that you need the hardware component that it would accomplish So I mean hardware stuff. Um, I'm a little bit like I kinda like hacking around. So hardware stuff that I like I have to kind of build out some of that stuff because Arduinos are so easy. Um, so uh, what I would really like to see um, for some of the stuff because one of the things I have on here is I I, I have Vim on my glass. Um, as ridiculous as that sounds because I like taking notes in the VI. Um, and uh, I use a Twiddler. Um, I'm very excited about the Twiddler 3 when it comes out because it will support Bluetooth HIV. And then I won't have to use a wire to uh, uh, type on, on glass, which will be cool. Um, would that, would that be Twiddler 3 is, will be a Bluetooth HIV device. Um, so in other words, creative inputs I think are fun. Um, but that's just me personally. I like hacking on them because I think they're really fun. Uh, but yes. What about the uh, browser? Uh, is JavaScript for that? Or something about it? Like JavaScript? So the web browser on Glass. They um, can't run JavaScript. So there's a web browser on Glass. Yes, it can run JavaScript. Um, but the web browser is not something you're going to programmatically interface with very often. It's mostly designed for taking peeks at web pages on search results. Um, and it's, it's, uh, the interface is great for taking peeks, but not great for surfing around. But the cards that are inserted via the Mir API, which may be what you're referring to, they are essentially tiny little web pages, because they're just web content that's displayed. Those do not run JavaScript. Um, they are static content. If you need something that's dynamic, that's when you switch over to GPK Lab and start implementing it there. Mm -hmm. 
using a web view on GDK. I guess you could. I don't know if I would go down that route though. Um, but yeah, you could. I mean, yeah, that would work. No, it does work. Yeah, sorry? Isn't that partly how the Mir API works? How the Mir API works. Yes, it is actually using a tiny web view that's loaded by the Glass Home um, um, APK piece of software uh, that has uh, been reduced a little bit um, for efficiency because running in the web views gets expensive. Um, so, in general, though, you get the best performance from doing Android views and stuff like that. See, I don't know who was who's who's had the hand of the line. Who had the hand of the line? Is there any information on papers or stuff like that available on how to solve the problem of projecting on the display? So projecting on the display, is there anything published on how this works? Not that I know of. I can talk to you a little about it. It's actually something you have to like so you have to can show you kind of how it works. Um, but I don't know, I'm not aware of anything published on it. Um, but there have been some teardowns that have inferred how it works. Um, so teardowns online. If you want to see how glass like looks inside, um, there are beautiful teardowns online. Um, you can actually learn a lot of stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's not magic. Like transparent displays, heads-up displays are, are kind of existing technologies uh, for the most part. Is voice recognition on glass local or remote? It is both. So where we can do local stuff for the most important phrases, we have models that are baked into glass. For example, all the items on the OK glass menu and some of the um, contextual voice commands when you're doing things like you just took a picture. Those all use voice models that are baked into glass, um, which are a little more responsive and work offline. For things that are more freeform, like I am saying a text message, it works as much like your Android phone, where it uses a web service to do that, um, speech specs. Are there any security restrictions with glass? Is, are there places you can't wear glass? Uh, yes, there are places that, that don't like glass um, being worn. Um, yeah, in general, like I will not wear glass in any place that does not allow cameras. Um, places that don't allow photography, I usually implement glass um, because they're often my glasses too. Uh, but uh, yeah, there are some places you know everyone can set their own policies on that kind of stuff, and some places uh, do prohibit cameras or prohibit glass. Can you try with glass? That is, I would encourage you to check your local rules and laws uh, uh, and uh, to determine if that is the case. Um, that is, it's currently like ambiguous territory and it, it changes, it's different from area to area. Um, so, the font that's being used currently, is that the only font you can use or is that the only font you can use using the Mira API? So the font that is being used, Roboto Thin, great font, beautiful font, is the only font that works. Um, if you are using the Mirror API, you'll probably figure out how to get a font. It is hard to use other fonts. We try and make it the only font you can use. You wanted a non-Western font. Uh, we have other other character sets on there too. So um, there are you can you can render other characters on there. Uh, one of my favorite demos is I can translate things into Japanese or you know. She'll tell me how to say dinosaur in Japanese, and it, it, it displays those characters too. If you are writing an Android app like GDK, you can do whatever you want with fonts, um, but our design guide is going to be to stick with um, the, the kind of sans serif fonts we have. Um, so I encourage you to use Roboto Thin, um, but depending on the problem you're trying to solve, go crazy. Uh, but yes, it does have a pretty wide variety of character sets in it. Characters in it. <coughs> Excuse me. So maybe we'll take. Three more Take two more, and then, more, and then uh, Jenny will possibly stick around afterwards. And yeah. You know, you can come up if you have any. Exactly. So, okay, so two more questions. Only people who have not asked questions so far. <laughs> How did the Google Glass project come about? I don't know the answer to that question. Um, in general, XLab, it is a project from XLab. So, in general, XLab is going to take projects. That are the intersection of three things a big problem, a breakthrough technology, and a totally crazy idea to try and solve that. Um, that, is, that is what um, X tries to do, um, but I was not a member of the lab at the very beginning. I've only been on the project for a couple of years, so I cannot answer that specifically for the last, and I've never asked. 
Last question. So, uh, okay, since um, so we talk about public, uh, is there any sort of I am not sure I completely understand your question. So using glass as a way of collecting data versus using as a way of consuming information, um, I would say that there, there are, it's going to be different than a lot of technologies that we're used to, and, and it's going to have different things as stronger and different things as less strong. Um, there is, um, for example, there is uh, a startup in San Francisco called Augmetics that uses glass extensively for doing medical medical um, scribing, um, in which case it's using glass primarily as a um, information collection device, which is cool. Um, and so it does definitely have some potential there. It has a lot of uh, opportunities there. Um, and then it's also great for, for getting access to information in situations where you wouldn't be able to consume it from a higher bandwidth thing. Um, like it's harder for me to hold a tablet up um, while I'm like riding my road bike. Um, but it's easier for me to take a peek up there and kind of see how far I've ridden and stuff like that. Um, so we don't really have any specific like philosophical direction we're steering people toward one or the other. Um, but more generally, it's like, do what works well on glass, and you're going to find it's a different mix of ways that you interact with the data, whether you're consuming it or whether you're, you're putting data in. Um, a lot more passive, pretty often. Cool. Okay. So I'm going to stick around, so feel free to come and ask me questions, um, and I will do my best to answer them. But thank you so much. Okay. Right, uh, before we go, um, I have the winners here of the I.O. Extended. Uh, I'm going to call out the names. Now, we are going to send out emails, so you don't have to be here, but if you are here, just jump up and scream your real loud. Uh, Michael Iliadis. Um, oh, and before you leave, make sure you get any trash around you, just pick it up and drop it off on your way out. Uh, Daniel Little, also going to IO Extended. Michael Gore. Nathaniel Russell. Bruno Carvente. And Anurada Raja, Gokul Kavanturi, my apologies for my pronunciation, uh, Samir Buna, Ken Nakagama, Maruto, Maru, Maruilo Maura, Kelvin Wong, and Kaylin Hobbsetti. Now, if any of these turns out they can't go, we will pick a new winner. We're keeping everybody who entered, we'll keep you on file. So if a new slot opens up, we will uh, notify you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.